If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open to the Gospel of John with me. John 17, we are going to be bouncing around today as we normally do, um, but we're going to be spending a lot of time in the Gospel of John. Uh, John 17 will be our main text, and then I've uh, attempted, uh, as I was going through this, to use as much from the Gospel of John as I could to limit the amount of page turning uh, that you have to do. Before we dive into the message, I wanted to just make two comments, if I could. Uh, The first being this, if you are a leader here at Cowboy Fellowship, um, first off, thank you. Uh, Can we give them a round of applause, all of our leaders? Uh, They are so important to the work of the church and uh, what we do from those who lead our teams to our lay pastors, our elders. Um, of course, our staff, and uh, we, we could not do the work that we do without them, so we are grateful for you. But uh, as you know, we do not have a leadership team meeting today as we normally do on this Sunday of the month. But I, I want to ask you if you could put whatever effort and energy you would have into our meeting after lunch uh, into your attentiveness this morning, if you are a leader. While this message is incredibly important for all of us, um, I think it's, it's vitally important for those who uh, occupy leadership roles and positions uh, in our church, and, and you'll see why as we move through it. So uh, I would just ask you not to take this Sunday off if you're a leader, but take notes and follow along as we, we talk through this. The second thing um, I wanted to address very quickly, if I could, is this. I, I get this from time to time, but uh, I got a a very forceful email this week from somebody who said, (laughs) um, and I'm laughing because, not because I took it lightly or because I laughed about it, but because I I think many of you will agree in my my, uh, response and my my reaction to it. Um, They said, you talk about the gospel way too much. And and, uh, surprise, I'm going to be talking about it again today. Uh, if, if you, <laughs> if you come to our church, you know, we, we talk about the gospel a lot and we use the Bible. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, the reason I talk about it as much as I talk about it, if I can, just from a personal note is this, it, it transformed my life. And, and how do you not talk about something that, that transformed your life. Um, number two, the reason we talk about it as much as we do here, I mean, if, if you want to go to a, uh, th- this person's particular point was, why don't you speak more towards the issues of our day? And, and they listed a number of things. And my point is this, if you want to go to a church that, that makes church about politics, or if you want to go to a church that makes church about the hot button topics that are on whatever news channel you choose to watch, there are plenty of churches that do that. Um, There there are plenty of churches that you can go to for that. That's not going to be this church because I believe that the gospel speaks to everything in our lives, including those things which we do talk about when they come up through our study of scripture. But I, I believe that the gospel is the only thing that can touch everything, and the only thing that can transform everything it touches. And so we preach the gospel, we talk about the gospel, and everything we discuss and everything we unpack is going to be through the lens of the gospel. And um, if, if that bothers you, then... then uh, I guess you'll be bothered if you continue to come here, because we're going to continue to talk about it. So with that, if you would, open your Bibles to John 17, and we're going to talk about division today. Division is a sensitive subject for many. It's one we don't want to talk about. It's one we don't want to face. No, nobody likes division. When I say division, I'm not talking about division. You know, division to see the future? That's not the vision I'm talking about. (laughs) Not division. I'm talking about division. Separation. And, And division is a painful 
reality that we all face. It's a painful reality of the destruction that happens when things fall apart. And like every other collision we have covered in this series, and like every collision we will cover from now until Easter and beyond, this one is painful, it's hurtful, it's irritating, it's tender on so many levels. Because with collision comes friction, and with friction comes pain. And thus, the reality is we don't want to talk about it, and we don't want to deal with it. But we must, because again, the gospel touches it, and the gospel has the power to transform it. The categories and classifications of division are endless. We could talk about family divisions, we could talk about work divisions, we could talk about friendship divisions, we could talk about marital divisions, which, and these come in all shapes and sizes, all of these that I'm mentioning, right? I'm just quickly throwing them out there, but marital divisions, for example, we can have small little itty bitty ones, and then they can manifest over time into a full-blown divorce, which is the ultimate marital division. There are political divisions, There are denominational divisions. There are theological divisions. There are religious divisions. And we could go on and on and on, but you get the point. There are a lot of divisions in our world. The world is full of division. And all divisions are the result of some kind of collision. And those collisions cause friction, and that friction produces pain and uncomfortableness and tenderness around the division. And the thing that all division collides with is unity. This is not a new problem. It's not a problem just for our church. It's not a problem just for our time or our generation. It's a problem that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans about and many other people. If we had time, we could look at other examples, but I'll share just this one, Romans 16, 17, and 18. You don't need to turn there. But Paul says this, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles contrary to the teaching you learned. He goes so far as to say, avoid them because such people do not serve the Lord Christ, but their own appetites. He says they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. So that's an example of the reality that says division has been around for a very long time, and a a specific kind of division that he's referring to here, the division that people create. People can create division, amen? How many of you have ever been in a situation where someone else created drama or division? Good, all of us, right? Now, Ultimately, we know it's the devil who creates and promotes all division. We can actually go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and see that division is one of the devil's oldest tactics. Again, you don't need to turn there, but in Genesis 3.1, it says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? He planted a seed of doubt, which ultimately led to division. It led to division between Adam and Eve. It led to division, ultimately, in the grand form between humanity and God, a division that you and I still experience today. In that moment of deception birthed out of the seed of doubt produced a division that destroyed a relationship between God and man. And it was all introduced by the king of division, the devil. And this has only gotten worse with time, and it seems to be escalating in our culture and increasing in our generation and our time. Division seems to be winning the day. Unity seems to be nothing more than an idea or a dream, a grand hope that we have that one day we'll get to experience 
some unity. And, and I'll tell you why this is, church. This is because the devil has a deadline. And he's running out of time. Jesus is coming back for his church and his people, and he's coming back for judgment. He's coming back to rule. He's coming back to reign. And he's coming back to defeat the devil once and for all. The devil knows he has a deadline. So he is doing all he can to create all the division he possibly can. And so we see this collision all around us, over and over and over again, this collision between division and unity. And today, what what I want us to do is unpack this powerful, powerful text in John 17, where Jesus is praying for you. He's praying for me. He's praying for us. And there's so much we could look at in this text, but what I really want us to look at is the idea, and even more than the idea, the example of unity that is presented in this text. Look with me in John 17, verses 20 through 26. And these are the words of Christ. He says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one, As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one. That the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you love me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and they have known that you sent me. Verse 26, I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. On one hand, this is a very challenging and daunting text. As we consider what it it means to possess the kind of unity that God and Jesus had with each other. On the other hand, I feel like it's an extremely encouraging text Because we know from this text that this kind of unity is actually possible. And that's good to know. So my big idea for today is this, that in a world of division, there is still a path to unity. We cannot doubt or ignore the fact that we live in a world marked by and plagued with much division. But there is still a path to unity presented through the gospel. The best example I know of of unity is found in this text. It's the unity that is contained and shown and exhibited through the Holy Trinity. The unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And even though the Holy Spirit is not mentioned here in this text, All of the things we're going to talk about today can be said of the Spirit of God as well. And if you and I want to experience unity at work or unity at home or unity in our neighborhood or unity in our church, we have to follow the example of the Trinity. So what does that look like? First, it means we must be united in motive. If you want to find unity, you have to be united in motive. It's impossible to have unity if we don't share the same motives. Think about all the different kinds of motives there are in the world. There are evil motives. There are hidden motives. There are selfish motives. There are deceptive motives. There are emotionally driven motives. There are short-term motives. There are long-term motives. There are social motives. There are financial motives. There are personal motives. And the list goes on and on and on, and these are just big categories of motives. 
you or I or anyone could have. And the reality is this, when we all have different motives, we will always experience some level of division. If we want to experience oneness and wholeness and unity, like Jesus talks about here in John 17, we must not have, we cannot have different motives. Scripture is extremely clear on this. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit all possess the same primary motive. And their motive should be our motive as well, by the way. Then and only then, when we share that motive, the motive that brought them their unity and gives them their unity, will we experience their kind of unity. So what was their motive? What should our motive be? Well, the primary motive of all three parts of the Holy Trinity is this, it's the glory of God. Just walk through John 17 with me, back up to verse 1, if you will, if you have your Bibles open, just look at verse 1, and we're going to do a quick walk here through John 17 for some context. In verse 1, Jesus spoke these things, he looked up to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. He says, glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. If you jump to verse 5, he says, now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. In our text in verse 24, he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am for this purpose so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. And we actually see this all over the Bible, y'all. We we see it all over the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we can just stay in the book of John for even more examples if you want, because it's easier if you back up to John chapter 7, For example, I didn't put this one in your your bulletin because I actually read it in my Bible reading plan uh, yesterday and it jumped out to me and I said, I got to put that one in. John 7, 16 through 18, where it says this, Jesus answered them, my teaching isn't mine, it's from the one who sent me. Again, we're seeing unity here, right? He says, if anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own. The one who speaks on his own seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And there is no unrighteousness in him. In other words, I'm not speaking my message or my words. This isn't my motive. My motive is the glory of God. In John chapter 8, verse 50 Jesus says, I do not seek my own glory. In verse 54, he says, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. My Father, about whom you say, he is our God, he is the one who glorifies me. As you walk through scripture, you see this. God is glorifying Jesus. Jesus is glorifying God. They're both glorifying the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is glorifying both of them. The motive behind it is the glory of God. Not who's getting the credit, not who's, who's, who's going to get to be known for it. The motive is God's glory. In John chapter 12, verse 28, he says, Father, glorify your name. And then it says, then a voice from heaven came and said this, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Jesus even speaks of this in regards to us praying in John 14, verse 13. I'm telling you, this touches and transforms everything. In John 14, 13, Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that, you might underline that in your Bible, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. It's not so that you can get what you want. It's not so that you can be happy. It's not so that you can know I'm a cool savior. It's so that my father will be glorified. Let's just look at one more real quick. This one's for us. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 
verse 31, where the Apostle Paul says this to the Corinthian believers who are struggling in so many ways, including with unity, and he, he gives them this challenge. He says, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything not for the glory of your church, not for the glory of your family, not for the glory of your life, not so everybody will know you're a good person. He says, do everything for the glory of God. Now, I want you just to imagine with me for a minute how many things would be fixed in your life How many things would be fixed in our church? How many things would be fixed where you work? How many things would be fixed in your marriage and in your family if the glory of God was the only motive you had? If we were all seeking that alone, how many dangerous and devastating encounters with division could we avoid? How many marriages would be saved? How many friendships could be restored? How many issues between children and parents could be resolved? How many church splits could be avoided if we just followed the example of the unity between God, the Son, and the Spirit that says there is one motive and we're all gonna seek that? You see, in a world of division, there is still a path to unity. And I want to encourage you and challenge you to take that path and to seek the glory of God in every area of your life. There's a second thing that is equally as important. They're not just united in motive. They are also, the three of them, united in mission. Three times in our text alone, Jesus refers to this reality that God sent him into the world. And he also talks about us being sent into the world. But if you back up into to John 17, verse 18, he, he says this, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now, being sent implies a mission. There's a purpose behind it. Again, this is not some obscure, relatively unknown theological reality. This is out there for everybody to see. Jesus was sent to earth on a mission of redemption. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, Jesus, again, these are his words. He says, the one who welcomes you welcomes me, and the one who welcomes me welcomes him, his father, who sent me. He sent me. In Matthew 15, verse 24, again, Jesus replies, and he says this, he says, I was sent. In Luke chapter 4, verse 43 and 44, he says to them, it is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. You see, there is division when we're all off serving our own mission and developing our own motives for those missions. There's great unity when we are united in motive and mission. Imagine again, just for a moment, any area of your life that you want, family, work, home, you know, with your parents, with your children. Imagine any area of your life right now that is affected by division. Now, what would happen if you and the others in that situation, in that scenario, were all united in your mission? What would that look like? What would that produce? Would that produce more division or more unity? The answer to that is simple, right? Unity. Before we we leave this point, I want to show you something really cool in John 15, if you want to turn there in your Bible. Here we're going to see what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. I want to just very quickly look at verse 26. And I want you to notice how in John 15, 26, God, Jesus, and now an example of the Holy Spirit are all being united and aligned in the same mission. They have the same mission. Verse 26. 
When the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also will testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. In other words, the Spirit of God is going to come to you, and his mission is not different than mine was or different than my father's. He's going to be testifying about me and the gospel I've come and shared with you. There's no division in the Trinity because they're perfectly united and aligned in motive and mission. We see it in other places like Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's not possible without the Spirit of God, but the reason the Spirit of God comes and brings power to you is so you can continue and then complete the mission. The same mission God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are about. It's supposed to be our mission. We're not supposed to have our own missions. We're not supposed to create and invent our own mission. The power of the Holy Spirit is there to enable us to participate in the mission of God by helping us be his witnesses in the world, y'all. That is so cool, and it's so encouraging to know that even in a world of division, there's still a path to unity, and that path is knowing that you're on the same mission that God is on. What is the mission of your life right now? What is the mission of your marriage? What is the mission of your family? What is the mission of your church? If it's not the gospel, you're on the wrong mission. If it's not the gospel, you're never gonna find unity because that's what the Holy Spirit has empowered you to do is be united around that mission. If it's not the gospel, you can expect to experience division. We have to be united in motive. We have to be united in mission. And then here's the third one. We must be united in message. Just as easy as as it is for us to see how people with different motives and different missions are going to experience division... The same is true for those who do not share the same message. The Holy Trinity is united in the deepest, most profound, most intimate ways because they're united in message. If you back up to John chapter 14, verse 10, again, Jesus speaking here, he says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? He says, the words... I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. In other words, this isn't a message that's just coming from me. I share the same message as my Father. I share the same message as the Spirit. The Spirit later comes to be our counselor and is proclaiming through us the same message that Jesus and God bring. He goes on here and he says, the father who lives in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the father and the father is in me. Otherwise believe of the, because of the works themselves. Jesus is not sharing his own personal message with the world or with you or with me. He's sharing the message of his father. They're united in it. He says, I'm not speaking by myself here. Now, go back to our text here in John 17, well, let's start in verse 8 of John 17, a little bit before our text. We see another example, Jesus here, he says, because I have given them the words you gave me. In other words, my message is your message, Lord. In verse 14, he says, I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You see, this amazing unity we see in the Trinity is not just a result of them being united in motive and in mission, it's also a result of them being united in message. If there's going to be unity in your life, if there's going to be unity in your home, if there's going to be unity in your marriage, if there's going to be unity in your church, there has to be unity in the message. 
We don't just all get to make up our own message. And that message can only be the message of the gospel. It's the only message worth uniting around. It's the only message that we see consistently all throughout God's story of redemption in his holy word that we hold in our hands. That message is the message of truth the world needs to hear. And any other message outside of that message is going to lead to division. It's going to be able to be exploited by the devil. It reminds me of Paul's encouragement to the church in Ephesus in in Ephesians chapter 4. The chapter starts like this in verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's a lot we could say about here, but he's urging them to unity. And then look at verse 4. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Our faith is a faith of unity because we only have one message to share. And this unity can be experienced throughout our lives, even in other areas of our lives, if we make that the message of our life. We have to be united in our motive and our mission and our message if we want to experience true biblical unity. And in a world of division, it's good to know there's still a path to unity if we want to take it. I will guarantee you every area of your life right now that you are experiencing division in right now is because the devil has divided you and someone else or maybe many others in motive, mission, or message. Or it could be this last one, number four. If you want to have unity, you have to be united in magnification. Who are you going to magnify? Who are you going to promote? Who are you going to make it all about? Is it going to be all about us? Is it going to be all about you? Is it going to be all about your kids? I know I'm stepping on some toes there, mamas. I'm sorry. But who's it about? Is it about your job? Are we going to make it all about our church and our buildings and our campus and who we are? Is, it going to, is everything going to be about your spouse? Is that your idol? Is that who you worship? Is, it, is everything about your hobby? Are you, is your whole universe circling around this thing that you love to do because you get joy out of it? Is everything in your life going to be about sports? Is everything in your life going to be about money? What's it going to be about? What are you going to magnify, blow up? What is it in your life you worship? Is it going to be about something like that, or is it going to be about the gospel and the kingdom of God? Because it can't be about many things, or both things, or all things. What are you magnifying? You see, when it comes to unity, that question really matters. Because division always sets in when we have different things we magnify. I want you to see the love that exists between God and Jesus and how they magnify each other through that love. In our text, we catch a glimpse of it in verse 24 where Jesus says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. We could also consider texts like John chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 For Jesus replied, truly I tell you, the Son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son likewise does these things. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. This amazing unity we see at work in the Holy Trinity 
is a result of them being united in their magnification of each other. This is why Jesus says things like, like I and the Father are one. That's in John chapter 10, verse 30, if you want to look it up. He says, I and the Father are one. He has no doubt of the Father's love for him, and he knew that God was going to glorify and magnify him. And God knew the same to be true about Jesus. I just wonder if the same can be said about us. I always think about that that part in Scripture where Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. Mary's found out she's pregnant with Jesus. Elizabeth is carrying John the Baptist. And these two ladies have a conference together. (laughs) And Mary's response is so powerful. Mary's response is so perfect. In Luke chapter 1, verses 46 and 47, it records it like this. It says that Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My soul magnifies the Lord. In a world of division, there is still a path to unity. When we choose to magnify the right thing. You see, divisions happen and occur when we start magnifying the wrong things in our lives. I want to close with this last one. It's very quick, and it's kind of the one that pulls it all together. They're united in relationship. We can't miss that. It's obvious, and it's right there in the text, but I don't want you to miss it as we close. They're, they're, they're not just united in these things we've discussed. They're united in relationship. Look at this text with me one last time. I want you to notice how it's all framed in the context of a deep, very intimate relationship. Jesus said it like this in verse 20. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. (laughs) May they also be in us. Do you hear the relationship? so that the world may believe you sent me, so that more can join this relationship. I've given them the glory you've given me, more relationship, so that they may be one as we are one, more relationship. I am in them and you are in me, more relationship, so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know you have sent me and joined this great relationship between all of us and have loved them as you have loved me, more relationship. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me, more relationship, where I am, more relationship, so that they will see my glory, which you have given me, more relationship, because you love me, more relationship, before the world's foundation. It's full of relationship. Because there is no true unity without true relationship. And church, I will be the first to tell you relationships are not always easy. Relationships are not always natural. Relationships are, are, are not always something we want to pursue with everybody. But I will tell you this, relationships are necessary if we desire unity. And it's good to know that in a world like ours that is full of division, there is still a path to unity. If you want to be united with God, you have to have a relationship with his son Jesus. Because of the division and the destruction that happened in the garden where we began our time together in God's word this morning, The reality now is we are all sinners. Not a single one of us is righteous. Not a single one of us is pure. Not a single one of us can attain salvation on our own. So if you desire to be united with God, you must have a relationship with his son, Jesus. If you don't believe me, listen to the words of Jesus one last time before we close. This is what Jesus said again in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, starting in verse 6. 
He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And then listen to this. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you're going to have a relationship with God, it's going to be through Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, if you know me, you will also know my Father. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him because we've seen Jesus. You see, only once that relationship is formed in your life, that relationship through Jesus that brings unity with you and God and the Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes into your life and seals you up, only once that relationship happens can you truly go on to pursue unity through motive and mission and message and magnification. Because if you try to do it without a relationship with Jesus, whatever motive you have is only going to be yours. Whatever mission or message you have is only going to be yours. Whatever you're magnifying is only going to be yours. And ultimately, at the end of all things, you will find that it will not be enough. And division will still creep in. It will still tear you up. It will still destroy and divide And cause you pain and grief that you don't want to go through. So if you have never called on Jesus, I pray you would do that this hour. That you would enter into that relationship with him and then pursue these things of unity. Let's pray. If you're here right now or can hear my voice right now, wherever you are, we invite you to pray with us to enter into this relationship with Christ a relationship he made possible through the cross, died for you so you can live. He made a way for you to come back into a right relationship with God. This is the gospel, the good news. And it is available for you and anyone else who would cry out and confess. So right there, wherever you are, I invite you to pray with me in the stillness of your heart. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. I know that I've gone astray. And through faith, Lord, I repent of those sins. And I ask that you would forgive me, make me new. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your goodness, for your love, for your mercy. And for this glimpse of unity. A unity that is made possible through my relationship with you. But extends to every area of my life. Thank you. Lord, as we close this hour, I know there are for every single one of us, myself included, areas of our life marked by division. Lord, I know there are faithful, Bible reading, strong, everyday praying kind of people in this room right now who still have division in their life because the devil is on a deadline and he's trying. Lord, I pray this reminder from your word and scripture today would encourage them, would build them up, and would let them know that unity is still possible. That even in a a world marked with division and filled with division, there's still a path to unity, and I pray we would be people who take that path. People who seek these things, people who find unity in them. Lord, I thank you for the great example that you give us. If a father is nothing else, he is an example, and you are the perfect one. So we thank you again for this example, and I pray you would give us the courage and the boldness to follow it. Lord, I pray that you would empower your people to be unity seekers above all else, and that the gospel would touch and transform every area of division in their life. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we ask this now in Jesus' name, amen.